today we're going to be looking at the three minor prophets who lived at the very time of Ezra and Nehemiah, namely uh, Haggai, uh, Zechariah and Malachi. And each of them shares a hope of the coming Messiah. Haggai is known for his prophecy in around 520 years before Christ, commanding the Jews to rebuild the temple. They're busy, they're focusing on their own lives, uh, they're doing things for their own houses, whilst the temple lies in ruins. And he's the first of the, the three post-exile prophets from the Babylonian exile of the house of Judah. We've got Zechariah, who's a contemporary, and then Malachi, who lives about 100 years later. And they belong to that period of Jewish history, which begins after the return of captivity from Babylon. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, we read, You expect a large harvest, but instead there is little. And when you would bring it home, I would blow it right away. Why, asked the Lord of Heaven's armies, because my temple remains in ruin, thanks to each of you favouring his own house. This is why the sky has held back its dew and the earth its produce. And friends, I just think it's important that we acknowledge that choices matter. God uses our obedience to change and work within this world. We are his hands, his feet in the world. So one of the major themes in this book is choice. Are we following the way of God or are we doing our own thing? In Matthew 7 verses 21, Jesus warns us, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. This is really important verse. It says, the one who does the will of my father in heaven it's not those who just say lord lord but it's those who do the will of the father okay so hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 to 9 we read and though he was a son speaking of christ he learned obedience through the things that he suffered and being perfected in this way he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him so it doesn't say he became the source of eternal salvation to all who pray a sinner's prayer, do an altar call, or whatever else, but to all who obey him. It's really important, isn't it? So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul writes, For in Christ Jesus, neither uncircumcision or circumcision carries any weight. The only thing that matters is faith working through love. It's faith that's working. It's a working faith. James chapter 2 verses 19 to 26 puts it this way you believe that god is one well good even the demons believe that and they tremble with fear verse 24 you see a person is justified by works not by faith alone and then verse 26 for just as the body without a spirit is dead so also faith without works is dead and i, I love paul's phrase that faith working through love well it's we're being so filled with the love of God that it just outflows into the world around us. And this harkens back to this theme throughout all of the Old Testament, that obedience is better than sacrifice. And it's us taking on, you know, that, that role in the Christian life of saying, not my will, but thy will be done. And all of us have those moments where we say, Lord, we're going to follow your way, your plan, your way of doing things in this world. Um, I think, you know, there's some scholars who today think that the English word faith perhaps isn't the best word to translate pistis, um, you know, the Greek term, and perhaps allegiance or fidelity might be better ways of doing it. And it is believing loyalty. Our actions, do they match what we say with our mouths? If we say we've pledged allegiance to Jesus as king of his kingdom, then do we live that out? It, do we live out that allegiance in, in the world? Do we follow in his way of living? Do we um, go by his rules in his kingdom? You know, how do we live out our life in the world? And Zechariah, coming to Zechariah, who's this contemporary, he has a number of dream visions and his message is that of hope. 
Um, and he's speaking into the situation. So you've got Joshua, the high priest, you've got Zerubbabel, the, the, the king of the line of David, or the leader, I should say, of the line of David. Um, and he's saying, you know, that hope through these leaders is only going to come if people depend on God's spirit. Okay. And he's got a number of messianic prophecies that he wants to bring out as well, especially Zechariah chapter 6, verses 9 through to 15. We've got a, a king who rides on the donkey, 9 verse 9, and the rejected shepherd in chapter 11. And the God's going to pour out his spirit upon all nations, and they're going to come to the new Jerusalem. So in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22, 23, we read this. Many people and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem, and they will seek the Lord of heaven's army and ask his favour. And the Lord of heaven's army says, in those days, ten people from all languages and nations will grasp hold, indeed grab the robe of a Jew and say, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And this is fulfilled chiefly in the apostles, because uh, it's through them, um, through them who are all Jews, you know, that the nations have come to know the God of the Jews. But, you know, it's repeated through history as well. It's not just them, but... Primarily, it's about, you know, the Jewish apostles and how they went and spread. And everyone from all the nations are now coming to the Messiah of Israel. Uh, so Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is legitimate, victorious, humble, riding on a donkey. On a young donkey, the foal of a female donkey. And then verse 11. Moreover, as for you, because of our covenant relationship secured with blood, I will release your prisoners from the waterless pit. OK, so it's harking back to that idea of a, a covenant in my blood, as Jesus refers to it. You know, as we take up the cup of communion, that's how it's portrayed, isn't it? It's a covenant in my blood. So you know, verse 11 here speaks of the covenant relationship secured with blood. Okay, it's the blood of the Messiah, but that is the releasing of prisoners from the pit. Okay, so Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey, then through his covenant relationship secured in blood, he releases the prisoners who are in Hades, who are in the pit, who are in death. Um, the one on the donkey is the one who brings about the resurrection of the dead. So Zechariah... Um, Verse 12, 8 to 10. On that day, the Lord himself will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So the weakest among them will be like a mighty David. And the dynasty of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. So on that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the kingship of David, the population of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. So they will look on me, the one they've pierced, and they will lament for him as one laments for an only son. There will be a bitter cry for him like the bitter cry of a firstborn. Again, there's some key verses here, again, linking Jesus with God. We're told that the dynasty of David will be like God. You know, the son of David will act in God's place and rule and reign on his behalf, his representative on earth, just as Moses was God to Pharaoh. Um, the language of looking upon the one that they've pierced is applied again by the disciples of Jesus to Jesus himself. You know, they look upon him who is and represents the Father so that Jesus can say, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. And he perfectly reflects God into the world. And then we've got Zechariah 13, verse 1. In that day, there will be a fountain opened up for the dynasty of David and for the people of Jerusalem to cleanse them from the sin and impurity. Again, this is talking about, um, about the, this fountain of cleansing of sin that is the Messiah. There, there's a famous hymn, is, is there not? You know, there is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners jump beneath the flood and wash all their guilt and shame. And so it's this wonderful image, isn't it, of being forgiven and being washed and cleansed and set free through the Messiah. Again, there's a, another reference to Jesus here in the cleansing of sin and of impurity. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Awake sword against my shepherd, against the man who is my associate, says the Lord of heaven's army. Strike the shepherd 
and the flock may be scattered. Again, this is a passage that the disciples quote to refer to the crucifixion. As the disciples scatter, they run as the shepherd of Israel is, is struck. Okay, the associate of God, the man who is my associate, as God calls him. Okay, the shepherd of Israel, he's struck. And again, these look to the future, to the Messianic age. So in Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17, we read, Then all who survived from all the nations who came to attack Jerusalem will go up annually to worship the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies, and to observe the Feast of Shelters. But if any of the nations anywhere on earth refuse to go up to Jerusalem and to worship the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies, they will get no rain. So again, it's this image of all of the nations coming to the New Jerusalem, and they're going to bring all of the stuff, they're going to be celebrating the feasts, particularly the Feast of Shelters, um, and they're just going to be coming up to Jerusalem to worship and honour the King who reigns over all. And Malachi writes a bit later, after Zechariah and Haggai, and he's summarising all of the Torah, the prophets, as this unified story that points to the future, that God is going to send a new Moses, a new Elijah, who will restore God's people and change their hearts. So it's harking back to this image we've been talking about long, many times before, about Deuteronomy 30, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, about uh, needing a new heart, a change of heart, a circumcision on the inside, not just on the outside, but we need a new spirit put within us. And, you know, there's this promise that God is going to send his messenger. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, I'm about to send my messenger who will clear the way before me. Indeed, the Lord you're seeking will suddenly come into the temple. The messenger of the covenant who you long for is certainly coming, says the Lord of heaven's army. He's the messenger of the covenant. Okay, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? The messenger of the covenant who we long for. Okay. Um, and it's talking about Jesus, talking about John the Baptist, Jesus cleansing the temple and then building a new temple, which is his body, the church, made up of believers from every tongue, every language, every tribe. God, Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 and 5 says this, Remember the law of my servant Moses, to whom at Horeb I gave rules and regulations for all of Israel to obey. Look, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. He will encourage fathers and their children to return to me so that I will not come and strike the earth with judgment. So Jesus is the new Moses uh, with a new exodus, it's a greater exodus from sin and death. Um, and John as John the Baptist as the new Elijah. And that's what Jesus says. He says, you know, if you will believe it, you know, he is John. Uh, he is Elijah who is to come. And. Um, so John the Baptist even dresses as Elijah, doesn't he? You know, wearing sort of eating locusts, you know, wearing skins, living in the desert, etc. Um, and he prepares the way for Jesus. So in conclusion, then, faith is working through love. OK, so it's about obedience, isn't it? Our obedience to God. It's not just giving him lip service and saying, yes, I serve you. But do we live that out in the world? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Are we those people who say, not my will be done, but thy will be done, just as Christ did in the garden, just um, you know, emptying ourselves, you know, like in Philippians 2, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who didn't consider equality with God as something that could be grasped hold of, but rather he emptied himself, becoming like the servant. You know? um, so I think that's how, you know, the attitude that we embody in our lives, not my will, but thy will be done. And then God exalts him to the highest place and giving him a name that is above every name. Um, so Jesus, the promised one, has now arrived. And so, you know, this is the very end, as it were, of these Old Testament prophets. And they're looking forward to the coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would be with us. You would help us to embody the life of Christ in the world. That we might be your hands and your feet wherever we go, whatever we're doing. We might bring honour and glory to your mighty, eternal, everlasting name. Amen.